Handouts were going around. There were not enough for everyone. If there seemed to be a high concentration of them where you're sitting, raise your hands so that we, they can be distributed to places where there are lower concentrations. If you have one to, to, to lend, that would be great. And yes, we intentionally printed it weirdly just to test your eyesight. <laughs> don't know how that turned out. I, don't even, I, I couldn't do that if I tried to do that. Uh, over the summer, as many of you know, uh, we combine uh, the sanctuary service and Beitenu, which means that we bring in styles of both services. And in Beitenu, uh, the presentation is a Torah discussion based on text rather than a frontal sermon. And so that's what we're doing today. In general, pretty much every rabbi that I know has two basic methods for how they prepare a text study. One is they know what they want to talk about. And they search until they find the sources that allow them to bring that out in an artful way. No. <laughs> Believe it or not. No. You don't say it. And the other way is kind of the very thing that brought us, most of us, to rabbinical school in the first place, which is this thing called study the Torah. Just open it up and see what it's delivering this week. Where is it taking you? I had no... Um, specific intent for this Shabbat when I was par uh, preparing Parsha Chukat. You know, there's nothing going on in the world, so there's nothing for me to uh, atta attach it to. <laughs> so I'm going to study Parsha Chukat and see what speaks to me. And I could not have imagined the directions that my own inquiry took me into. And what you're seeing is a concentration of the sources that I got exposed to, many of whom, not only individual texts, but but general sources from the tr tradition and the halachic tradition, the legal tradition, and the Hasidic tradition that either I haven't looked at in a long time or I've never seen before. The tradition is vast. And I want to share with you something that stems from a very short but emotionally packed scene in Parshat Chukat, which is actually beyond what Mark and Rick read today. Uh, and I'll I'm going to read out everything I have because some people are following by, uh, by Zoom and I want to make sure that everything is said out loud. Uh, this is intended to be a conversation if you want it to be. I have plenty to say. But if you are starting to say, please contribute, and I'll repeat it back to the microphone so people who are joining digitally can participate. So the first source on your sheet from chapter 20, verse 1 through 2. Vayavo b'nei Yisrael kol haidamid bartzim. All of the children of Israel came as a single congregation to the wilderness of Tzin, Bachodesh Harishon. People are not sure if that means either on the first month or on the first new moon, because Chodesh can mean both month and moon in the Torah. So if we wanted to actually date when it was, and this is of the 40th year. This is at the end of their wandering. So this is the, either, either the first new moon or sometime in the first month of the 40th year of their wanderings. Vayesh hev ha'am and the people dwelled at Kadesh, and the next section doesn't even get its own verse. It's the second half of a verse. By the way, Miriam died there, and she was buried. She doesn't even get a whole verse to describe her death. This person who saved Moshe from the water, and as you'll see from Midrashic interpretation, is the source of nourishment for the people throughout the wandering. The next verse, which people attach to Miriam's death, gets more attention than her death itself. There was no water for the congregation. What inference would you or anyone make out of the juxtaposition that Miriam dies and instantly there's no water for the congregation? The inference is what? She was the the She's the source of the water. Or that there's got to be some kind of um, causal or um, coincidental connection between her no longer being alive in the world and the people um, really experiencing profound thirst. Why else would the Torah, which is scripted so intentionally, juxtapose those two ideas? Vayikahalu al Moshe v'Aaron, and the, the the very thirsty congregation rose up by turned into a kahal, but here the word kahal doesn't mean they became a nice shul congregation. They became like an enraged congregation against Moses and Aaron saying, we are thirsty. Not the only time where they express that rage. Rashi, famously on that verse, on the, on the verse, 
Mikan, from here we learn, Shekol Arbaim Shana, all 40 years. It's actually 39 years because this is the beginning of the 40th year. I don't know why he says 40 years. Hayalehem Haba'er, the well that according to the tradition traveled with them. There was a miraculous well. Every one of those stops that we're going to read about in a few weeks in Parshat Matot. They encamped, they put it at the Mishkan, they found a well. They decamped, they moved to the next place, they encamped, they put it at the Mishkan, they found a well. The only reason why that well followed them throughout the desert, according to this read of Rashi, is because Bishut Miriam, because of the merit of Miriam, and he gives us the source. It's from the Talmud, Tractate Tanit, uh, uh, page 9, verse, uh, side A, right? This, by the way, is lyrical, and it's also symmetrical, because Miriam's significance to our people begins with saving Moshe from the water, and then her death ends up helping us realize that it was through her that the Israelites had water, right? So it is a, she's a woman and a sister and a leader who gives the thing that you most need in the desert water, right? And who saved the future people, uh, leader of the Israelites from the thing that water can sometimes do to you, which is actually take your life. Water can, you must have water to live life. And as anyone who has lived through both drought and flood, right? The absence of water and the overabundance of water can be brutal. Miriam is a representation of the perfect harmony of both. Okay. That's the classic read through Rashi and the Talmud of Miriam. But once you start looking into Hasidic texts, you get some interesting stuff. Look at source three by Shmuel Donat. If I had come across this sage before in my 30 or so years studying the tradition regularly, I have no memory of him. I've never come across that name as far as I know. A commentary called the Chidushe Shmuel. He was from Pressburg, which is in currently Slovakia. Those of you who might be on the synagogue uh, trip next year to Poland and to the Czech Republic and to Budapest, we're going to be driving right by Pressburg. We can say hello. I think he's buried there. Vatamocha Miriam Vatika Vershan. It says that she died there and she was buried there. He asks a very good question, although I've got to tell you, I've read this verse a thousand times in my life. I've never thought to ask this question. Lama nichpelet nichpala milat sham. Why is the word sham which means there, repeated. She was buried there. She died there. She was buried there. Would not one there have been sufficient, right? It's a good question. And then he repeats it. Vatamot sham, she died there. Vatikaver sham, she was buried there. Ita be chazal. We have this idea in chazal. Chazal is an act and a meaning. Chochmenu zichronam levracha. Our sage is a blessed memory. So it's, a, it's like a, a short way of referring to the sage of the Talmud. But if you have to explain it, like I just did, it becomes a long way of referring to the sages of the Talmud. But I'm bummed. Tractate Megillah, page 15a. Tzadik avad. When a righteous person dies, lidoro avad. The righteous person is lost to the generation. Very classic, terse, Talmudic thinking. When a righteous person is lost, the person is lost to his generation or to her generation. What's implied in the Hebrew is the word only. That when someone of true merit is lost, is gone, who suffers? Those of us who are still alive, who wanted that person amongst us. But the idea is that only we suffer because the Talmud is leaning into the metaphysical idea that someone's righteousness has material realness in the upper realms and for all generations, and that even though we might miss that righteous person, the righteous person and the righteousness is not gone from the world. And it keeps going. Mashal Adam, this can be compared to a person. Sha'avdalo Margalit, you lost a pearl, you lost a jewel. Kol Makom, switch the page. Shahi, Margalit Shema, you lost the pearl, but wherever the pearl is, it's still called a pearl. Right? So who's the one who suffered? Only you, because you don't have your, your gem anymore. But the gem isn't gone. The gem is sparkling somewhere. Unless it's been destroyed, the gem just is no longer available to you. In fact, the next person who finds it might find great beauty and joy from it. Similarly, when a righteous person is lost the generation, we who wanted that righteous person amongst us, we are bereft. But true righteousness doesn't disappear it just is no longer as accessible to the people who live in the mortal realm. It goes on, lo avda el The uh, pearl is only lost to the original owner. Ulachen ba'ah 
That's why, according to Rabbi Shmuel uh, Donat, the Torah emphasizes she died there and she was buried there. Kirak Shamaita. It's just there that she died. That's where she took her last breath. It's just there that she's buried. Aval Shma, her name, Ugdulata, and her greatness, Nisharu Ladorot, continued for the generations. It's the very thing all of us hope for in a short mortal life that our death is not our end, that our influence persists that we might even be someone like Shmuel Donath, who a couple hundred years from now will have written something and someone will unearth it and teach it to the next generation. Right? Whether you're a scholar or simply a human being, we are the only species that is burdened with the notion of the limitations of our life. We're aware of our mortality pretty early on in our development. It's crushing to confront on some level and therefore one of the most common aspirations of a human being is to do something, create something, write something, make something happen, such that what we are gone, our influence is not gone. Right? And so, yeah, she did die there. She was buried there. But Miriam's influence is still amongst us. We're still talking about her today. It's a really lovely read of just a, a, a doubling of the word there. And it represents about half of the Jewish tradition's understanding of death, which is that it's not an end. It's a beginning of a new way that your soul and what you accomplish in life has a chance to live on after you. That's about half of what our tradition says about death. But let's go deeper, because we're going to see hints at the other half through a very strange ritual that I knew nothing about until I started doing this deep dive on these sources. This is from, this is source four. It's a collection, it's an oddly named collection called From His Old Connection. That's what the book is called. It's a collection of, of Torah insights and witticisms, mostly from the Chabad Lubavitch tradition, but not exclusively. On the same verse, Miriam, Miriam died there, and they had no water. Mikan Haremes, from here we have a hint. La minhag, to a custom which I had never heard of before coming across this, which is in Yore Dea. This is the second section of the Shulchan Aruch written by Rabbi Yosef Karo in the 16th century. So in Yore Dea, chapter 339 5, Lispoch et hamayim to pour out any water in the vessels, Beshebishchunat hamet, in the neighborhood of someone who has died. Apparently, it was a pretty common custom in both Sephardi and Ashkenazi communities because the Ashkenazi gloss on this, on, uh, on this text, Rabbi Yosef Kara was a Sephardi rabbi living in Svat for the most part. He also lived in Greece and, Thess and Thessaloniki. And then a couple of years later, Rabbi uh, Moshe Isserlis, who was an Ashkenazi rabbi based in Krakow, whose grave we're going to visit next year of those of you on that trip. It, wasn't, uh, it was, was not supposed to be an advertisement for next year's <laughs> trip. Um, it was a common custom. Someone dies... The first thing you do, and I've never seen this, never heard of it, is to take any water that was already pumped and poured into some vessel and pour the water out. According to this collection, the hint, this is hinted at in Miriam died and there was no water. And why was there no water? Because they had gotten rid of it. Why had they gotten rid of it? Because it was a custom. This is an anachronistic throwback. It's clear that's what was happening in the story. But it's, he's saying that thing that we Jews do now, we can connect it to that moment where a uh, heroine dies and all of a sudden there's a lack of water. And he continues. Hashach, this is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch by, called the Siftei Kohen, which is uh, shortened to Hashach by Raishab Tai Kohen, who lived in Lithuania in the 16th century. Hashach Mazbir Tamir Hag, he describes this custom in a simple and logical way. Why do you pour out water when someone died? If you would ask me why one would do that before reading this, I, 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 mean, I guess I could, just using raw like, imagination, I could come up with it, but there's something obvious to me about why water gets poured out when someone dies. According to him, it's to serve as an oat, a sign, an announcement, it's basically we have announcing a death. 
right? And if this is customary, you can imagine how striking it would be. If you did live in a community where when someone dies, and remember back then, people died in their homes. They weren't dying at cedars, right? And they weren't dying in car accidents or, or plane crashes. They were, got old and or they got sick and they died where they were. And people lived in the same area. You can imagine what it would be like to walk through the pathways of your village and all of a sudden you see someone coming out of their house and pouring out water. You know exactly what's happening. It would be very, very striking. The lo yitztarchu lahodia befeh, precluding them from having to announce by mouth, levaser habsora hara'a, in order to announce the bad news. To which I say, why? What's the advantage in a communal setting or in a religious setting or a spiritual setting to have a ritual announce a death rather than have to say, bad news, everyone, Shlomo Goldberg has passed away? Why? What's the advantage of that? What does that possibly accomplish? Stuart? act in a particular way to mourners um, and, and essentially we, we provide the script huh. for everything that is, that is being said and that's sort of the same thing going on here. Great, I'll just repeat that. Stuart said that it actually reminds him of the fact that we try to spare mourners in the immediate aftermath of their loss of having to do just about anything because they're so focused on their grief. So this is a way of saying if it might even be just hard for you to get the words out of your mouth, my mother died, my father died, my husband died, my child died, and that happened a lot back then. Just, just pour water and everyone will know. Fascinating. Mark? Sensor. Mark is the same thing. Anyone else? Just use your imagination. Why would that custom develop and with that rationale? Yeah, let's have them pour out water, and that way they don't even have to announce it. What does that earn us? Any thoughts? There's an answer that's given later on in a different text, but I wonder if anyone else had their own thought. Someone's pointing at someone. Laura. Laura. <laughs> no, my mind went to sort of gossip and people starting to talk and you know the, the weight of words I mentioned on that. Very good. So Baruch Shekivant, you had the Kavanah that we're going to come up to later. The idea is that that it it might be impossible, particularly amongst Jews, <laughs> to mention someone's name and to mention that they died without the inevitable chatter. What an sob that guy was. <laughs> Or, or she deserved it, or God finally took her, right? It's a way of just removing words from a moment that is beyond words, right? It's actually very powerful, right? And I, when I, for those of you who've been at funerals where I officiate, when we do the filling in in the grave, I invite everyone to come fill in the, the, the grave, which is a very important mitzvah, I invite everyone, and usually this lasts about 30 to 90 seconds, to do it wordlessly, to not have it be chatter around the grave. Like, let's focus on what's happening. Let's not have this be a moment of words and speaking. Let's have it be a moment of ritual. It's very hard to do. People are usually chatting about 60 or 90 seconds later. But for the first 60 seconds, it's quiet, except for the sound of the shovel in the earth. And when you have no words but just visual ritual, you're processing it on a very different level. And sometimes we talk to um, distract ourselves from the enormity of what's going on. Maybe there's something, that, something like that built in as well. Let's look at the Shulchan Aruch. I had never, uh, as far as I know, read this line in the Shulchan Aruch. This is, cha- this is source number five, Yoredea. That's the second section of Shulchan Aruch, chapter th- 339, five. Minhag, it's a minhag, lishpoch kol ha-mayim to throw out all, or to pour out all of the already collected and pumped water in the... Um, uh, in the neighborhood of the person who died. So it's one line that apparently represents a pretty common custom. And now I'm going to bring you uh, several different commentaries on that. So the Shulchan Aruch uh, is still being commented on. And here's one uh, of several commentaries. Source 6 on page 3. Called the Be'er Hatev, which means the good explanation. It's one of the classic commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch, written by, written by Rabbi Yehuda ben Shimon Ashkenazi, who lived in uh, Germany and Poland in the 18th century. One of the rare sages whose last name was Ashkenazi, who was actually Ashkenazi. Most Ashkenazi last names represent a Sephardi family, which is interesting. That's for another sermon. But this is Rabbi uh, Yehuda ben Shimon Ashkenazi, who was Ashkenazi, Germany and Poland. He says, on the word Lishpoch, 
Why? I got to tell you, the next, the next line, I don't think I fully understand. If you understand it, help me out. The angel of death, who for some people in the Jewish community then and now is a real being, right? It, it's, it's an actual force in the world that when someone takes their last breath, it's not pure physiology and biology and a lack of oxygen to the brain. It's the angel of death, the same one that spared us on Exodus night, knocks on the door and is the one through God who takes life away. I'm not even sure of the syntax of this, and I don't know if I translated it right. Something like, the angel of death brings down with water a drop of the dead, of, the, of blood of death. I don't even know what he means, but something about connecting the fact that since bl blood is no longer going to be coursing through the body, and somehow the angel of death does that with a drop of water, and therefore the pouring out of the water is like evocative of the angel of death's bringing water. But move on to the next thing. Ube Tashbetz, and in the book called the Tashbetz, Rabbi Shimshon ben Semach Duran, who lived in uh, Spain and Northern Africa, 14th, 15th century, Katav, he wrote, Shera'a achat sheshata mahamayim. He once saw someone drink from the water that was already poured out in someone's home where someone had died before it got... Um, Sorry, that was poured into a vessel. He saw someone drink from it before it got poured out. They had been in the house in the moment of death. And when the sage saw this person doing the opposite of what you're supposed to do, he, instead of pouring it out, he was consuming it. Ga'arbo, he rebuked him. Don't drink that water. And a short time after, after he drank it, Yatsani Shmato, he died as well. Shaloto Shashata, the person who drank the water, the tainted water, the Malachamavit water, the water that we want to get rid of our from our houses because it's the water that was kind of sitting in the house of someone died, that person died, according to this story. Vishalulachacham, and they asked that sage, Mara Itashagab Artabo, what did you see? What did you witness that you rebuked him for drinking the water before he died? It wasn't helpful that you because it, it, he kept drinking, but what did you see? Amar, he said, Anira iti et malachamapet. I saw the angel of death. Shashishaf et sakino. He was like cleaning his knife. Bemayim shayuba otohabayat. In the water that was already in the vessels of that house. Le'achar ptiratamate. After the person died. What you're beginning to see here in this ritual is a very real understanding from some of our ancestors that death comes at the hands of a force in the world, the angel of death that brings it. And this should come as no surprise, it's an awful thing. Right? It's very different than the first notion of Miriam died, but she's still amongst us. Miriam died, but her influence is with us. Miriam died, and, and we should celebrate the eternality of her soul. This is the ritual of someone died, which means someone took their person's life, and that someone is the angel of death. And let's dissociate ourselves as much as possible from anything that might be tainted by the angel of death's presence, because the angel of death was washing his knife in the water, because we don't want another death, right? The first way of looking at it, which is inspiring, is sort of a romanticized version of what we can think of in terms of what happens after, after death and to help us come to terms with it when it's someone that we love or our own impending death. But the ritual represents a much more grounded, understandable terror, a terror that someone was alive and is no longer, that someone breathed and is no longer breathing. And we want to get as far away from that as possible because we cherish life. We're a this world tradition. Look at the Be'er HaGaulah, Rabbi Moshe Rifki's uh, 17th century Prague, which is one of the places we're going to be on the synagogue trip next year. <laughs> Maybe we should, oh, and I didn't even mention Poland. Lithuania, we're not going to be in Lithuania. But some people, when we went to the Balkans, thought we were going to be in Lithuania because the Balkans and the Baltics sound very similar. <laughs> that actually happened. I announced on the bus to the trip to the south that the next trip we were doing was going to be go to the Balkans. And someone came up to me in the front of the bus and said, so excited. I'm so excited we're doing that. I've always wanted to go to Estonia. Actually, Estonia is Baltics. Not Baltics. 
Okay. Um, he wrote a commentary called the Berhagula, also on this ritual. Could, why? Kadeshi adu shemate, so they should know that the person died. Veloyo diu bepe, the motzi diba. This is what uh, Laura was saying. That why do they pour it, uh, pour it out? So there's a ritual that prevents them from having to say it out loud, so that no one, by saying that someone had died, will invite diba, calumny, right? Lashon hara on that person. Uchatav harada, and the rada, which stands for Rabbi David Abu Draham who wrote a collection of Jewish rituals a couple of hundred years before. Sheesh remes lezeh, there's a hint of this ritual, min torah the verse we've been on this entire time. V'tamot sham Miriam, that Miriam died there, v'tikaver sham, she was buried there, v'lo haya mayim leida, that um, there was no water for the congregation. And he says it explicitly. Why was there no water? Not because the well dried up. Kikulam shavchu memihem. Everyone in the congregation poured out their water, lest the angel of death that took Miriam take them. And guess what? Afterwards, there was no water. It's their own fault. Right? Very different than, ah, the well that represented Miriam is gone. It's no, everyone poured out their water bottles. And guess what? When you're in a desert, don't pour out your water bottle. <laughs> Look at source eight. We'll end with this. This is the Ben Ishchai, a beloved uh, halachist from Baghdad in the 19th and 20th century, right? Back when there was an enormous and, um, and a prevalent uh, Jewish community in Baghdad and in many other cities in what's now Iraq and Syria. Uh, and look what the Ben Ishchai says. V'chein sarich li hizaher ma'od. You've got to be very careful. B'mayim mishumed. In the water with respect to someone who's died. Lishpoch hamayim. To pour out the water. Shayu babayit shabo meitamet. In the house that the person had died. And look how technical he gets. Because remember the word in the Shulchan Aruch was everyone in that neighborhood. So of course the question is, well, what does determines the neighborhood? Is it like if someone dies in, in, uh, in um, what's this neighborhood called? Higo Robertson. Robertson. Let, everyone has to pour out that water? Right? I was thinking of, well, what's right here? South Parthe. Parthe, thank you. Parthe. Right? So what's a neighborhood? Gam bayit sheni, the second house next to the house. Uvayit shlishi, and the third house. Mikol has tadim from every direction. Right? So if someone dies, according to him, this is what they did in Baghdad, the, the two houses in every direction from that house were considered close enough to the infected home that they had to pour out their water. And as the sage known as the Chida, Rabbi Chaim David Azulai, who wrote in Jerusalem, Italy, the 18th, 19th century, this is the custom of the holy city of Jerusalem. Anyone know what that uh, uh, acronym stands for after Yerakodesh, Tat, Tet, Vav, Bet, Bet, Aleph. You see it on a tefillin box. Tikonein v'tibonei b'mheira v'yamenu amen. May it be reestablished and may it built speedily in our days. Amen. That's what those five letters mean and that's what's written on, I think it's the Shel Rosh box of tefillin. Whenever you say Jerusalem, you often add that on. V'chein amin hag po irenu Baghdad. He says this is also what we do in Baghdad. It's so infected, this water, that to wash your hands with that water, of course, don't drink it. Or to wash the clothes, it's our source, prohibited. Because we want to stay away from anything having to do with death because we're unromantic about death. Death is the end. And we want this to be a house of life and not for other people to suffer from whatever is going on at water. And even if you make a mistake, Ubishlu, and you cooked with that water. O afu, or you baked. But otama mayim, az have tashil the hapat asur. Even the thing that you cooked with the water should not be eaten. Right? The reason I bring this to you is, first of all, it's so interesting to see the the nitty gritty pikayun development of Jewish law, and the extent to which, however this minhag came to be, they took it so seriously that even if the water had been transformed into a thing, a cake, a bread, even that had too much of a remnant of the water that had been in a vessel, in a house, two houses away, where someone had died, throw it out. You don't want to be connected to it. Jen. Water now is of life, and water is Yeah. Which we never think that way. Correct. Right? What, what Jen said is through these rituals and through the story and through these laws, water is a substance of life. Water is a substance associated with death. And again, if you have experienced either flood or drought, we know that, even though mostly we think of it as mayim chayim, right? A mikvah is mayim chayim, living waters, right? 
but sometimes it's the waters in a house of the opposite of Chaim, of death, and we want to stay far away. Uh, skip a little bit. Um, yeah, look at the second paragraph. The Azda Hamayim Esarim, the extent to which this water is prohibited, Hainu Dafka Im Hayumayim Levadam. That's only if the water was like sitting out on its own in the moment that the person died. Aval Im Bisha'ashame, look how specific. If in the moment the person died, Hayasharui Bamayim Ochlin, if there was already food soaking in that water, it wasn't just water by itself, Ain Esarim, then you don't have to prohibit it. Something to do with the fact that the Malach Hamave would only be cleaning his knife in clean water, not in water in which you were, you know, marinating a pickle or something. I have no idea why that was the example that came out of my mouth. <laughs> Anything that had food in it, which means that throwing it out would cause a certain amount of loss. The angel of death is kind and sympathetic. He's going to ruin your water because water, at least in these places, was considered more prevalent. But he won't be a jerk and put his Malach HaMavet, angel of deafness, into water in which you were already soaking or cooking food, because he knows, or she, I don't know if the angel of death is male or feminine, um, that, you're gonna, that that would force you to have to throw that out. He doesn't want to cost you any money, right? So the ways in which the angel of death, haha, is being animated here and personalized as being the agent that takes life but doesn't want to overly burden the community is fantastical, but it's also a, a wonderful expansion of this idea. And it's, I think every generation is trying to deal with what actually happens when someone goes from being alive to being dead. Um, yeah, look at the last paragraph, and then we'll finish up. Oot katav harav zal. He also, who's the he? It's the chida above, Rabbi Chaim David Yosef Azulai, said uh, this. De'im nit arvu mayim ha'asurim. If water that was prohibited, it was prohibited because it was in a vessel, in a house in which someone died. Mishumet, for a dead person. Bamayim k'shirim, if that water got mixed in, what normally happens when things get mixed in, treif or kosher, milchik and fleshik, they get what? Nullified, well, they get nullified at what uh, mathematical ratio? One sixtieth, in certain conditions, not in any condition, right? You can't... I would say you can't do it intentionally. You can't take a very, very, very small piece of cheese and put it on a very, very big hamburger and say <laughs> it's less than 160th and bite very, you know, very judiciously and say, hey, one in 60. Right? <laughs> the first time I learned that rule, I was like, ooh, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you can engineer that. No. <laughs> and liquids for sure, right? So if you're cooking a pot of chicken soup, which shouldn't be fleshic, but it is, and a little bit of milk. <laughs> Let's get her a second day yuntif. Let's get her, and let's have chicken parmesan as long as it's ve vegan chicken, right? Um, what? You're doing great. Thank you, thank you, Rabbi Shah. Chicken has just been declared parv. Chicken is parv. It is parv. When was the last time you milked a chicken? <laughs> if a little bit of milk falls into a, a beef soup, look at a beef soup. A beef soup. If the amount of milk is less than one sixtieth of the volume of the soup and it gets mixed in. You can eat the soup. Not here. It's so toxic, this death water, that if a water that was prohibited because it was in the house of someone who died gets mixed in with maim kshirim, kosher water. Kosher here doesn't mean kosher is supposed to, not kosher, it means kosher meaning drinkable because it wasn't infected. Lobat le bishishim. Not nullified in 60, benesru kol hamayim. And all of it is prohibited. Listen, mostly I wanted to share this with you because I just found this fascinating. And I love... I've been doing this for 30 years, and when I find new rooms in our scholarly tradition that I was never, I was never even in this house before, I'm thrilled, because it means I have that much more to learn. And I think it's a wonderful opening up of five Hebrew words. She died there, and she was buried there. And then the next notion of there was no water. And that leads into a conversation which simultaneously holds up the mystical, spiritual, metaphysical notion that Miriam is still with us, and she's still inspiring us. And she's gone. And she will never live again. And that's traumatic for anyone who cared about Miriam or anyone who died. And we want to distance ourselves as much as possible from anything associated with that loss and that grief because it's so overwhelming. And I think that's what we're still dealing with to this day in this era. Every time we confront the impending end of life of someone who we love, right? we want to 
lean into the idea that maybe it's not the end on some level. Maybe our soul and our spirits will reunite on some level. And that person's influence persists. And it's horrific. And we grieve understandably. And our darkness and our heaviness comes for good reason. And both of those things can exist simultaneously in the tradition and in the heart and minds of any individual person. Mark, last comment. This, this is very fascinating. And it's caused me to think about one thing in particular that we didn't talk about in, in the text conference. Could, has anybody, has any scholar commented on the fact that maybe, possibly, we do this as a remembrance of Moshe because Miriam's death, the lack of water, the, the, the crying out of the people led to his downfall because of the incident of the rock. Interesting. What Mark says is maybe the, the, the custom really does derive from the notion that Miriam died and that that moment began the beginning of Moshe's downfall. Who knows? Um, I don't know. And again, this is the first time I confronted this, so I don't know the tertiary levels of scholarship on it. It did remind me when I read about it of the, was it the white smoke or the black smoke when the pope dies? Yes. Right? They don't? Oh, what, what happens when the pope dies? They bang on his head with a hammer. Yeah, but don't, isn't there also a nonverbal announcement that's a way of knowing that the pope died? The black smoke. The black smoke, right? That's the election. No, the white smoke is the election. The black smoke, they died. Black, black smoke, if they don't elect the Pope, they burn the ballot. Oh. And if they do elect the Pope, sorry. I, I, what did the flag have next? I thought it was the black smoke. I'm going to go with that, that <laughs> even though it's incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> the black smoke would die because it was a way of saying we, we don't want to announce what that. The, 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 <laughs> was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>